Don't these guys look sharp? <laughs> I'll change for you guys. <laughs> Frank dressed up. <laughs> So a lot has happened with the microbiome. So update us on the latest and greatest in microbiome research. Ooh, I can get started there. Good. Uh, so much going on and learning about how the microbiome plays a very powerful role in regulating insulin sensitivity and blood sugar. Uh, but I think even more fascinating than that is the role of the microbiome and how it affects brain health. And one of the more fascinating things that I've seen is a type of short-chain fatty acid produced by the microbiome called butyrate, uh, which comes through the types of foods that we eat. So the fibers in the diet feed a group of bacteria that then create a set of metabolites that feeds these butyrate producers. So we're feeding one group that then feeds the other group, and this butyrate can get through the blood-brain barrier, and it turns on the transcription of blood brain-derived neurotropic factor. So a direct connection between the microbiome and neuroplasticity and learning and long-term memory. Mm. So what are the good things and bad things we're turning on there? Well, you know, it's, it's really extraordinary what's going on in the gut because we just thought it was poop, right? And now, now we realize that, that it's actually the engine that drives almost everything. If you look at the diseases, as you mentioned, it crosses all organs in the body, all systems. And to me, what's really exciting is not necessarily just mapping the microbiome, which are the bugs, but the things that they produce. So, so when you think about it, we've got about 20,000 genes. We have 10 times as much bacteria as our own cells in our gut. We have 100 times as much bacterial DNA, which is about 2 million genes. And each of those genes produces proteins. And those are all messenger molecules. And so there's this thing called the metabolome of the microbiome that nobody's really talking about, but that's an enormous influence on, on everything that's happening from our brain to autoimmune disease to the mitochondria, and this is communicating to every system in our body. And I think that's really the future is understanding what the metabolome of the microbiome is and how that's interacting with everything and how to regulate that through diet, through, through other factors that we can use, products and supplements. So you mentioned diet and other factors, like what in terms of nutrition and diet, what's new there? And then also I want to talk about stress and environment. Oh, but I want to well. burst the bubble here, guys. Um, I want to go back to what Paul Hawking talked about this morning, because the way we've been looking, this is, I don't know if the research is going there, but this is me going back to Chinese medicine roots where we as human beings are the microcosm or the macrocosm. And what Paul was talking about today, this is an ecosystem. This is much more than about good guys and bad guys and just measuring specific things. This is how do you keep an ecosystem in balance. So there's, it's a much more sophisticated system. There are fungi, there are parasites, there are bacteria, and they are actually viruses. I mean, viruses play a big part in yeah. our gut. You know, most people think of viruses as, as uh, HIV or influenza virus or... Uh, Epstein Barr, but the viruses are there to protect us. Those viruses that are in the gut don't infect hum animals, humans. So they're there to protect us. So there's this very complicated ecosystem that we're screwing up by what we're eating, um, not getting enough sun, just by, by, the, by our lifestyles, all the chemicals. And I think when we start thinking about it that way, instead of what we do in Western medicine, in Western culture, we break everything down to specific things I think if we can start looking at this bigger picture, it's much more complicated than that. And I was speaking to Dr. Mahmoud, who's, who actually named the microbiome. I think you're in the audience, right? I hope so. Um, and <laughs> thank, you for the, th thank you for the term. So, and um, I'm, you know, I'm usually like, um, you know, coming up with this old school way of thinking, but I think if we... If we can start thinking that way, I think it would be very healthy. I, I still think there's a problem with breaking everything down into specific things, measuring that specific thing, because you, you're missing the big picture. So well, sorry to, 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 uh, to, to burst the poop bubble, but that's... Uh, in, in that light, um, you know, we're sort of reductionistic in yeah. the testing of the poop and the results that we get, or even doing PCR analysis uh, where you get some idea of what might be there. But I think the next frontier, like Dr. Hyman was saying, is the metabolome, because it's really what are they producing? And how are those uh, proteins, neurotransmitters, how are they affecting the body? Because that gets absorbed into the body. 
So with all this new information, what can people do? People want a healthier mi microbiome. Oh, well, well I mean, the, the, you have to learn how to tend your inner garden. It's, it's like it's soil, right? So you have to yeah. fertilize it, you have to water it, you have to not do the things that are gonna disrupt it. And I think we live in a very gut-disrupting society with processed food and sugar, lack of fiber, the overuse of antibiotics, C-sections on the rise, acid blockers, anti-inflammatory drugs, all these gut-busting drugs, the environmental chemicals and toxins, all of which affect our gut microbiome, glyphosate, um, the refined oils, it goes on and on. So we have to eliminate those as much as possible, and then we have to fertilize it with, with prebiotics and resistant starches and add in probiotics, and, and also, you know, just stress alone will affect your microbiome. So really everything relates to your microbiome. Exactly. And we have to get dirty. Exactly. It's we the have way to get we out used there. to live. We have to get out yeah. in nature and, uh, you know, a little bit of soil is good for us. There's yes. a microbiome in the soil. Unfortunately, we're kind of killing that microbiome with genetically modified crop. But uh, that's part of what creates our microbiome. That's why having a pet is so great for mm -hmm. your microbiome because pets are out there in the soil and they bring that to you. So when your dog is licking your face, that's actually good. Yeah. They're, they're giving you some diversity to your microbiome, and diversity is the key to health when it comes to the microbiome. I get excited when it drops up on the floor, I can eat it right away, it's really good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I go, it dropped on the floor, I'm gonna have some. This is Mark Hyman approved. Never wash my hands. Three second rule. Never wash my hands, no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. It's been there overnight, I don't go. <laughs> three second rule. Ba so. Basically, sanitized living is, is not particularly healthy. So we're also going to talk about the we mitochondria, but we're not pulling this out of left field. So talk about the, why we're talking about the microbiome and mitochondria and explain what, what, what mitochondria is, what are to people. Well, interesting, mitochondria actually come from bacteria. They were bacteria that got incorporated into cells. So that's an interesting um, <clears throat> idea. But here again, I'm going to give my Chinese medicine perspective. In Chinese medicine, we talk about qi and energy. And I think, from my take, um, the mitochondria are the Western pathophysiological explanation of what <coughs> energy is. It's, a, it's just a different language because the, the uh, mitochondria are the energy powerhouses of the cell. That's, you know, your body takes food and, and air and then creates this ATP, the energy from the, you know, in the mitochondria. So I actually think the mitochondria, it's your chi. It's, it's sort of another language for talking about energy. I want to add a shamanistic perspective to that, that the mitochondria are what they talk about as the feminine life force because we inherit our mitochondria only from the mother, from the egg. So it's handed down from generation to generation, always through the female, female lineage. So we're depending on our energy from the women out there. Mm. Which is, yeah, okay. I mean, this it, it, is probably one of the most exciting areas of research. Because yeah. every, everything that we know that has to do with longevity and wellness and health comes down to the mitochondria. Because all the things, for example, the microbiome's toxic influence, when it's not right, is affecting the mitochondria. It affects the brain. So mitochondrial dysfunction really depletes energy, and all your cells need energy to function. So whether it's, your, whether it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or whether it's uh, gut issues, whether it's, you know, any, any real age-related phenomena, whether it's diabetes, obesity, heart disease, are all connected to mitochondrial function. And so a lot of the things you're gonna hear about later about intermittent fasting and ketosis, and they're all driving mitochondrial wellness. And I think that's, this is, this is therapeutically, it's a huge area for me as a functional medicine doctor. It's where I go very often to, to treat people, to unload the, the burden on the mitochondria, which is our diet, stress, toxins, yep. inflammation of all sorts, microbiome disruptions, and then learn how to optimize the mitochondria. And, and lifestyle also, medicine and does that. That's basically what we're talking about. It's how you sleep will affect your mitochondria. Going into the sun is going to affect your mitochondria. How you move, um, how you eat, all these factors that are important uh, that we talk about in lifestyle medicine or functional medicine affect mitochondrial function. So it's the mechanism of what we're suggesting. And it's it, like, talk about going to the root of things in functional medicine. Uh, we... We think of fatigue as a thyroid issue. Maybe somebody has a thyroid dysfunction, but how many people out there ha are on thyroid medication and still feel tired? 
I think it's because you've got to go underneath that and look at what's happening to the mitochondrial. It's, it's probably at root, there's a mitochondrial mm. dysfunction that's yeah. happening. Yeah, so how do you know when something's wrong? Yes. If someone out there watching, you know, they don't have access to you guys, and they're like, oh shit, that may be me. What do I do? Like, wh or... Well, you know, a, a, a lot of people have what I call FLC syndrome. That's when you feel like crap. And it's <laughs> <laughs> a worse form, it's FLS. Uh, <laughs> but, but it, you know, the common symptoms people have of fatigue and depression and muscle pain and aching and cognitive dysfunction, they're all related to mitochondrial dysfunction. And I think, that, you know, there are tests we do diagnostically look at it. Um, everything from urinary organic acids to look at your energy metabolism cycle to things like VO2 max, which is looking at your exercise performance, which reflects your mitochondria. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you can actually identify those issues and you can actually treat them with using the science of functional medicine. And the interesting thing is that those same symptoms you just mentioned are the types of symptoms that are linked to leaky gut syndrome. Mm -hmm. So thus we tie the, the gut health to mitochondrial health. All these things are connected. Yeah, so for example, fructose is, it has to be absorbed as an energy dependent phenomena. So it, for, you use extra ATP or energy when you're absorbing fructose for the gut and that creates a, a lack of energy in the gut that then releases the cells from being stuck together in tight junctions, you get a leaky gut when you consume a lot of fructose containing stuff. So what are like the worst things you could do for mitochondrial function? If you're like, you know what, sugar. I'm just gonna destroy it. Sugar is sugar. the devil. Sure. Um, you have a strong uh, opinion on that. Uh, that yeah. Sugar is the worst thing for the mitochondria and actually yeah. probably the best food for the mitochondria is fat. Yeah. So they actually do better with fat, um, with a high Type fat. Of fat though, well, this is why they'll talk about it later why intermittent fasting is so great because it can help shift your mitochondria into mm -hmm. fat metabolism. Which fats, yeah. though? Talk about the good, not all fat is created. No, equal, healthy so. fats. No, MCT oils and, and, and coconut oil are preferred fats for the mitochondria and they get burned. Yeah. And they, they... Yeah, but even omega-3 fatty acids, I mean, yeah. any fats are, basically don't be scared of fats, good fats. But the, the other mitochondrial poison is antibiotics. Yeah. If you think that the, the, the root of mitochondria is they were bacteria that then lived inside uh, mammalian cells, so they're just as affected by antibiotics. Mm. And I, I have a question for you guys maybe, what, statins, I actually feel that, you know, I've seen a, a lot of yeah. um, patients side effects from statins, which I feel the mitochondria have probably been destroyed, I don't, I'm not sure about Yeah, absolutely, I mean, when you, when you look at the mechanism of statins, they block CoQ10, CoQ10 is one of the nutrients that's involved in the generation of energy in your mitochondria. When you block that, you have trouble with energy, which is why you get muscle pain and muscle damage. Talk, talk about CoQ10. Well, CoQ10 is one of the cofactors in what we call the electron transport chain, which is how you take food and oxygen and turn it into energy. So there's a whole, it's like a little assembly line, and CoQ10 activates one of the key enzymes to produce energy. And, but you need all the, all the ingredients, right? It's B vitamins, it's right. lipoic acid. The, the it's thing about this whole, the, this whole reaction that happens inside our cells it's, it's a controlled chaos, because if things go wrong, you can generate a lot of free radicals. Mm -hmm. So it can either be good, and you need a, a diet that's rich in antioxidants to be able to buffer those free radicals, and mm -hmm. if you don't have that type of diet, you're gonna cause mitochondrial dysfunction, and you're gonna cause a lot of oxidative damage inside your cells. And yeah, I mean, I think, I just wanna underscore what Frank said. You know, there's a lot of studies on aging, and a lot of it looks at mitochondrial function, calorie restriction, intermittent fasting. They work by optimizing the mitochondrial function, which then leads to longevity. And the things that actually poison the mitochondria are things like sugar and refined starches. And, and the studies looking at the genes that are regulated, their sirtuins, the FOXO genes, these, these are genes that actually improve insulin sensitivity. They improve your ability to like deal with sugar. And when, when you eat too much sugar, those get damaged, so you don't actually produce the energy effectively. So what is the future? Where are we gonna be in a couple of years with mitochondrial function? I, I think we're getting smarter and smarter about diagnosing and how to treat it using diet, using supplements. And I, I mean, we're having next, uh, in two weeks at Cleveland Clinic, one of the leading researchers in autism who has identified mitochondrial dysfunction as one of the key drivers of autism. And it's get, using mitochondrial therapy with CoQ10 and, and acetylcysteine and lipoic acid and creatine and other nutrients to help optimize these kids' brains. And these kids are recovering from autism. Wow. Even looking as, at mitochondria as, as part of the root cause for diabetes, mm -hmm. mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, but then just one simple thing that everybody can do to increase the amount of mitochondria in their cells 
is to exercise. Mm-hmm. But another simple thing is have a cold shower at the end of your hot shower. The thermogenesis actually also stimulates mitochondrial function. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of that, that uh, Wim Hof, uh, that Wim Hof uh, yeah, breath Wim work Hof, and yeah. then going, you know, going, jumping into something freezing. But just, you know, have a, a freezing cold at the end of your shower. Just, you know, put on the cold water and, and do that every day. But, you know, get, it, get some sun. Sun is good for it. See that you sleep properly. Avoid the toxins in your food. Exercise. All the things we're talking about. We're talking about a mechanism that probably the suggestions we're talking about in lifestyle medicine, in functional medicine, that's probably the mechanism of why it's so successful. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the key thing about the microbiome mitochondria, these are, these are two of the key biological networks that are in functional medicine that we focus on. So we don't focus on diseases, we focus on the causes and the mechanisms. And the microbiome and the gut and mitochondria and energy are really two of the most fundamental processes in the body. And when we understand how to diagnose those and treat those, we can heal so many diseases. Amen to that. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.